What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? I am BDLM coming to my buddy J4Y, bringing you episode number 92 of our Dota on a Man podcast. What's going on, my friend? How's it going? 92. That's right. We're uh, getting up there, getting closer to our century of age. Uh, God, it's been, I think, three years now, roughly, we've been going it here. It's uh, The number's starting to feel real right now. And, you know, this is our third international we will be discussing which is kind of cool in itself honestly i'm uh liking it a lot how are you doing i'm exhausted hmm. i know you are similarly tired life yes. is life is full of busy hmm. but um you know it's it's great to to be able to come here once a week and and just get to talk about some fun stuff man and uh i like every week we have a, a great show for you Great stuff to be talking about. Um, we have a, our, our first ever DoD question of the week, which we're going to hopefully have a more attractive name for <laughs> in future episodes. Um, we are going to be talking about the international, both in the, the new prize pool number, as well as uh, the setup for the tournament, which has just been announced. Talk a little bit about uh, ESL1 as well. And then, of course, if you guys were alive and aware of Dota over the weekend, you know that the Dream League finals happened, and they were real it was amazing. Yes, sir. You, you, you put it right. I mean, we've been uh, we've been pretty crazy with the personal life, but that doesn't stop Dota 2 from happening. And, you know, it's been fortunate that we've been able to make time for both uh, this week. Like you said, uh, there hasn't been a lot of time for fun computer time, <laughs> like as in like playing the game. But, you know, we get a lot of satisfaction out of just watching and then doing the podcast and the show. So, you know, we get our own kind of form of fun, if you will. I, I've only done one of my five for the Wind Ranger request. So, see, he was smart to put it at just five because I think we all knew better than for me to try to do something greater than that number. It honestly, I it, it just impresses me more how quickly you got through your 25 games of Tusk. I know that should that was a feat in itself, and the fact that I actually finished it too. That's true. Impressive. You only cheated a lot for most of it, but oh. you did finish it. <laughs> that's what counts. That's, yeah, that's, that's what, what matters. counts. Finishing, you know, as long as the guy does, it's all good, right? Exactly. That's <laughs> exactly how I try to live my life. But uh, you know, I I will get to say though. Well, how was your win runner game? We have to. The, the one. Well, I guess that is the thing to discuss here. Uh, Wind Ranger game. Uh, yeah, it was it was pretty good. Um, I well, no, actually, it wasn't. Now that I think about it, it was it was actually pretty much the opposite of good. I I played her middle like I wanted to, uh, and that was kind of the whole idea is to follow in the footsteps of uh, of Arteezy and others who have played her mid. Um, and I did all right in my lane, as I recall. But the rest, there was there was one lane bottom specifically. Uh, there is only one lane bottom all the time, but most of the, there, time. most of the time there's just one. But there was two heroes down there on our team who just over and over just would die. And there was a Morphling on the other team who ended up being 9-0-2 in about 10 minutes. Normal. So, you know, as much as I was doing decent work in mid, I got a kill in my lane. I was farming well. I even tried to come gank once, but it's almost, it's, it's hopeless at some point. And... That Morphling got a Lincoln Sphere in about 14 minutes, and then an E-Blade in 22. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it was pretty much an uphill battle, and unfortunately it did not come with a win. I didn't get the Aghanims. I was trying to build it. I got the Maelstrom and the Phase Boots. That's about as far as I got with my build. So I, I went for it. I liked the uh, I liked the ulti attack. It was really fun. It netted me a couple kills and uh, proved really effective, actually, so it was pretty cool. Had a few. I mean, are you looking forward to the other four games? I mean, did it uh, make your special places wiggle a bit? Like, did, were you? <laughs> it doesn't take much for that to happen, but no. yeah, I uh, no, I, I was actually uh, I was also really happy I got to use this new skin I have for her, so that just made it all the better. But uh, yeah, no, I I really want to actually do it in a game where there isn't like one ridiculously out of control hero that I have to deal with, and where I get to actually like build the items I want, and I think that'd be really cool. So yeah, I think the other four. Hopefully, will not follow in such a fashion. Yes, I would like to point out that I was not a part of this game, so I couldn't help carry you. Avoided to victory. it well. You avoided it well. Dodge. Um, yeah, I mean, like you mentioned, we like I I got to play a little bit of Dota this week. Um, it was nice, and uh, you know, it was actually a a great lead-in, great segue 
to our Dota on Demand question of the week. Mm-hmm. Um, and just also to point out, we, we've still, we're, don't worry, you guys will find out exactly what's going on soon. We're just, you know, you know, just hold, be, be patient. <laughs> we're doing work over here, let me tell you. And um, our, our Facebook and our Twitter is, are going to be a lot more active in the future. Um, and so we want you guys to stop by, come to the Twitter, come to the Facebook.com slash Dota On Demand, at Dota On Demand, um, and, and give us your feedback to the question of the week. Uh, it is, uh, what is your favorite successful troll strategy? What do you take into the pubs that is just ridiculous, that makes no sense, or maybe just a beautiful kind of sense that you just like to dominate with? Because I, I got out there and uh, I played a couple games with Ollie with Magic Man this past week. And he was like, hey, let's do Axe Tree. Dual lane. We go bottom dire. And I'm like... What are we doing here? Y- yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, no, we're going to go behind the tower. And that's that's the plan. That's the entirety of the plan. That's exactly <laughs> what's going to happen. What are they going to yeah. do? Come at us, bro. So like, all right, yeah, why not? Let's do it. It sounds just crazy enough to work. And oh my god, it was beautiful. We went up against a tri lane. It didn't start as three. Um, the support was like middle east, trying to put some pressure there, run around ward and whatnot. Uh, eventually he came, and it just didn't matter. It was spin to win, just behind the tower getting kills. You know, we were against a PA that got like absolutely nothing. It was just beautifully tragic and i made me just what could a pa possibly do against tree and x that's like two very scary people for pa to be honest there Uh, was there was so much just survival at almost no health because of tree armor too mm. that it was just amazing you get the agonims of course you get the blink i mean what more do you really need no my question is i to me i feel like x and tree should be like mortal enemies just in their names themselves yeah but yet yeah. they work so well in harmony together. That's it's quite impressive. That's a great point. That's you know, it, that's the beautiful thing about Dodo Jay is it brings people from different walks of life together <laughs> in a beautiful way. In a past Please. life, they were enemies, but now on the battlefield, they fight as one. Yeah, it is be- so. Yeah, I want to know, and and Jay probably does too. I don't maybe. Uh, what what is it that you guys like to take out there and just completely roll kids with? Um, one other stuff, Jay. How about you? How about you? You give us your weekly update of the, the prize pool. Ah, yes, the prize pool. It's uh, believe it or not, still growing. Um, and we've actually met another milestone, as was posted on our page today. Uh, we're up to nine point six million dollars. So we're only four hundred thousand shy of our uh, ten mil goal. And once again, would be fresh out of stretch goals again. Uh, you have to imagine they're done at this point. They're like, all right, you guys are crazy. That's it. We're we're over it. You know, I mentioned in a previous episode, someone suggested uh, that, you know, 23 should be Valve buys the uh, copyright back for Wind Ranger and the couple, Skeleton King and things like that. But uh, in all realisticness, realisticness, that's probably a word. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I just, it's just, it's just incredible that it's still growing at this astronomical rate. I mean, yeah, it's obviously slowed down from what it once was. But the fact is, it's still getting up. It's going to hit that $10 million before. And $10 million for a video game tournament. Uh, this is the fourth year it's been running this. You know, started at a million for the very first one. For the grand prize. 1.6, I guess, for the grand prize pool. But the, it's just it's just unbelievable how much participation this is getting from the community. I mean, did you, think, did you ever in, foresee anything like this happening with the Dota 2 community? I feel like... I mean, I don't think, you know, I expect it to ha- happen this way, but it is nice that you have sort of, I guess, another way of seeing how people are able to lend their support and other than just, you know, showing up to watch or playing or, you know, going to community websites and putting in their two cents. You know, th- this is like a real way of, hey, how much support can you can you give this thing to build... Um, the game up to, to I mean it's really you know Valve giving the opportunity for everybody who loves the game and loves watching the game to make history out of it because they could have just left it the same this could have been a very average prize pool but it's really everybody's contribution that is really making this a record setting year and you know there's obviously uh, a little bit of selfishness in trying to get some immortal items 
because we all need to turn people into fishes when we play lion. <laughs> but um, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like it's just amazing that um, it, it really is uh, the community that's helping make mm-hmm. Dota set these records. Which is why we love you guys yeah. so much, and we, we, that's why we're so community driven too. It's like this community of this game is unlike any other one I've played with. Uh, you know, I mean, of course, you've got your ups, you've got your downs. <laughs> that's going to be what it is. But, you know, for the most part, there just seems to be so many positive people that are really looking to put this game, and not only this game, but really esports in general, in this kind of direction. And it's these kind of things. I mean, how could this not be on more media outlets? You know, like, $10 million tournament for a video game. Like, I could totally see that hitting newspapers, you know, whatever have you, uh, just because of the sheer number there. Uh, And the turnout being at that new venue, it's going to be, what, over... 10, 12,000 people at this thing. I mean, this is going to be a nasty, not nasty, but a really big event and uh, really impressive. What they unlocked at the 9.6 uh, was the A to Z challenge support. So now there's a quest system that lets you track your progress, uh, earn your rewards as you win with all the Dota heroes. Apparently these rewards, I didn't actually even realize that up till just now. So that's kind of cool in a way. Uh, you know, we talked briefly about it, and obviously if I'm struggling to get five Wind Ranger games in, this may not be the thing for players like me, but totally want to see our viewers get out there and kick this challenge's ass. Um, okay, we we challenge you all to race, to be the first one to complete the challenge as a DoD fan. Let us know on the Facebook oh, and or the Twitter as soon as you complete the challenge. And not that we wouldn't shout you out anyway, because, you know, what's up? But um, we will, of course, shout you out and call you champion of letters. And uh, <laughs> it'll be beautiful. So go out there. Yeah, I, I want to say, too, just as, on your point, you know, how is this not going to attract attention? I think it absolutely has to because you look back at, um, if you remember that snippet from Free to Play where um, Fear is, like, with his mom and they're watching on the news about him mm-hmm. going and competing at, you know, over $1 million, and the Linux was like, oh, $1 million video game tournament happened, and a local joy to play. And, I mean, $10 million is... Uh, nothing- money can legitimize anything, Jay. Whatever. <laughs> it's the American way. Yeah, exactly. It- I mean, Beanie Babies were practically gold at one point in time. <laughs> so... till the know. great fall of 92. Yeah, I don't know what happened at that point, but... Uh... No, I, I completely agree with you. It, it really, this is just such, and this is setting a precedent. I mean, there's been other prize pools that have been really close to their past ones, but $10 million, there, nothing's even touching that. Nothing's even close. And this is going to, this maybe even ignite a spark for esports across all the boards. You know, maybe other games, uh, its competitors, or even StarCraft or different genres are going to maybe step up their game, do other models, find what models work. You know, the free-to-play model itself, you know, was kind of just brought in after so many years of it not even being looked at, and look how successful it became. So now this con- contributory uh, prize pool idea could start getting picked up across all the genres, and you might start seeing prize pools, you know, I don't know, just suddenly uh, growing all over the place. Yeah, I agree. And, um, you know, I, I guess just also to talk about the international, we finally got confirmation of what the actual setup is going to be and, you know, I could explain it um, totally because my mind is capable of understanding the craziness and the extensiveness of what goes into what's going to happen mid-July. But, you know, it, I I feel like I would just, you know, I'll let, I'll let you explain it because oh. you're so cute. Wow. Mm-hmm. Anyways. Uh, <laughs> so, um, if you guys recall correctly from the past uh, internationals, there before was the, uh, well, there was the wild cards that played last year, uh, had the one winner come in. That's kind of staying the same. So, the, except of course now there's four qualifier runner-ups that are going to be playing, uh, best of three matches, uh, and then uh, the one victor will enter into the grand scheme of things, right? Um, and so instead, last year, there were two groups, and uh, two groups of eight. Uh, top four of each one went to the winner's bracket. Bottom four, loser's bracket. This year, teams just get eliminated. They just, they're just gone. And it's, it's, it's a little tragic, 
but it also puts the pressure immensely on these players for the group stage. So uh, there's just now one group, 16 teams. Every team plays one another once. Um, it says a minimum of 120 games we played over four days. So uh, cancel everything you have that week. <laughs> just grab yourself three large Costco cases of Hot Pockets and uh, seltzer water. I don't know what you drink. That sounds like an old person's drink, so maybe something else like soda. I don't know. Water. Do what you will. Anyways, and just lay back and just accept the fact that you're going to watch a ton of Dota. Um, And what's basically going to happen after all those 120 games are going to be played is there's going to be first and second place. Uh, Those two teams advance directly to the main event upper bracket. The next eight teams, so third through tenth place, will uh, enter the playoffs, and the bottom six, vanquished. I mean, how do you feel about that already? Obviously, it's super different than the past years. Um, I, I think I like it. Um, I think that this means that there are going to be less, I guess, throwaway games. Um, you know, now it's not just for, for place. It's for staying in the tournament at all. And... Um, you know, you might not get to a spot where you go, oh, we're comfortably going to seed, all right, so whatever. Um, now it's, okay, we can't leave anything up to chance. We have to go hard. My, I'm kind of wondering, like, if we're going to see as big a variety in strategies um, because I feel like every single match that's going to get played is going to be so important now. Uh, so I'm interested in seeing, like, what the number of total heroes played is compared to mm. last year's international, which was so varied. Although that being said this year, the, ev- so many more heroes feel so much more viable in the current patch that, you know, there may not be any change at all, you know, or it might be even an increase um, in the heroes play. Maybe Meepo actually gets to pick it international. Who knows? It's going to go crazy. Uh, but um, Probably only in the troll games, but <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, you, you know what? You don't know. It could happen. But, uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's how that's going to go. Uh, and then phase three, they're calling it. There's three phases, right? Uh, day one, uh, they're yes. basically going to have uh, three, three different matches. And the losers are going to get placed in this bracket. And, uh, well, half the losers. The other half goes into day two. And they basically, they're going to fight their way up. And uh, three of each of these two little brackets are going to make it into the grand event, meaning there's eight total teams for the main event. I don't know why I use that voice, but that's the one I felt right. It was good. I liked it. Yeah, that's probably how they should do it all the time. Um, Mm -hmm. But yeah, so this obviously is now including those top two that we talked about, that overall in the group stages, they're already here in the upper bracket. Uh, The other six teams are going to get placed both uh, the top two in the upper bracket the bottom four in the lower bracket. And they're going to start duking it out. And this is going to be where you're, what you're used to from the previous ones, where upper bracket, lower bracket. you got to fight your way out. Obviously, you get eliminated from the upper. You go down to the lower. And then the grand event, it's going to be the upper bracket winner versus the lower bracket winner. So nothing different there, really. Um, all of these games being best of threes, I think, is except for the grand final being a best of five. Oh, that's great, isn't it? is um the most amazing thing this was something i mean when we were talking even about the qualifiers that i really thought was important was just that you you can't say there's no excuse to not win this unless you're just lost to a superior opponent i feel like how can you not there's nothing is left up to chance here you are given more than your fair shot at winning this you know all-time high grand prize there, you know, you can't blame, you know, a, a Pudge Chen strat maybe for completely changing the way things go. I mean, it's you have the opportunity to come back from the most crazy, ridiculous thing ever if you're able to to pull games out. Um, so I I really enjoy that. I really think that um, there's actually I, I read the article that was on Join Dota about this, and I have to shout this guy out. He was uh, How eighty eight. Who just wrote this beautiful little summary of like what um, a- appeals to him about this setup? And um, another thing you mentioned too is just that this main event it's going to be <laughs> the literally the best of the best 
um, brought here for the main event, and I believe this is going to cut down on the total number of games for the whole event. Yes, or for the like the main deal. Um, all right, don't quote uh, me. Maybe I don't. I don't know. I definitely did not do. If you're asking me a math question, you know I, I'm not involved in that. I think numbers are here. Um, but basically, you know, he he had mentioned that. You know, it's not going to be, you have to sit there for 12 hours straight watching Dota, which, you know, when we were at the end, too, it was like... What's wrong with that? <laughs> I mean, as much as we loved it, there were times we were like, okay, if they pick Tiny Wisp one more time, we're just going to kill ourselves by eating Chipotle, which we That's did. That's the best way to die. We did one way. But, uh, okay. yeah, no, I definitely agree. It's, uh, it's, it's weird. It's like... They're really harsh and strict in the group stage because you get eliminated if you if you suck or if you don't do well. But then they're like, oh, okay, but we'll give you the best of three. It's kind of like they shifted where they wanted the focus. They didn't want the group stages to be, um, you know, as drawn out as I guess as really important. Well, not drawn out at the same time, but like you know, they they really wanted the grand event, the main event, I should say, to be where all of it is on the line, you know, as it should be. These are the literally the top eight teams in the world, and they're giving them all their fair chance. It's not just this one match, oh, yeah, we got this rat Dota strat, you know, J4Y's amazing uh, Troll Warlord OD Enchantress lineup, and they just beat us, and I couldn't deal with it, and now we're out of the international. You know, you, that's not going to get you eliminated. Now, you lose that game, you go into game two, you ban maybe one or two of those heroes, or you, whatever, pick differently, and you have a fair chance. So, yeah, I really like, uh, I definitely prefer the, the minimum best of three theory for this kind of thing. Yeah, so here's my question now, Jay. Uh, how do you feel about this compared to ESL, which actually just released their schedule and grid um, single elimination? Done. That's all the more complicated it gets. They drew brackets for the eight uh, teams, mm -hmm. and they're just going to go at it best of threes uh until the the grand finale which i believe is a best of five um how i mean do you find the international setup overly complicated or do you find esl too simple maybe did you say best of ones no i said best of okay, threes. i was gonna say i was very confused um no i mean obviously these are very different dynamics of uh <laughs> of uh tournaments uh you know, I, I like the simplicity, actually, of the ESL one. I, I, I don't know if that's necessarily the best way. Maybe it's the most fair way is by the, 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 the whatever, random chance to get matched up against each other. Because at the end of the day, you figure these teams all uh, qualify. They're all pretty much on equal levels of skill. So it's kind of hard to determine who's what and where. Um, but I, I, it's like I said, I like the fact that it's at least the best of three theory. So you get that, you get that opportunity to come back if you get kind of trampled by something you were caught off guard by, or maybe you had just one really rough matchup or game, you know, you still have that chance to fight back. So, you know, I, I really do like it. I appreciate that. And it's not going to be too drawn out, you know. I mean, it's going to be pretty much straightforward. These these are the teams that mate here. We don't need to do group stages. We don't need to do all of that. Just let them play it out and fight, fight their way to the top. I guess the only thing that could be uh, considered disappointing here is that they're not going to all play each other in this tournament. Yeah, that's true. But, I mean, I think there are there are some, like, neat things. For instance, uh, the one of the first games is going to wind up being Alliance versus Cloud9. So, already uh, going to have a rematch of the Dream League finals. Um, I believe the Asian teams cannot meet until the final. Um, so, we are going to get to see at least um, you know, several games of west versus east to give us another little um taste of what to expect out of the international so yeah i i think it's it's uh it's gonna be interesting and i think for me looking at esl i'm gonna be most interested in seeing how Fnatic does because they're not playing with this excalibur instead yeah. of era and um you know they did fine they did fine he actually he, he did a good number he did a good job filling in there and uh now they're probably going to buckle down and really start practicing like crazy together now that like all this era stuff is confirmed. And they're going to really see if they can fit him in. I mean, obviously it's not the perfect fit. 
you know. But like I said, it, it, it's it's unfortunately it could be like a Mason situation had they had more time. You know, obviously it's not quite nearly as much as time as Mason's been playing with EG, but. Um, yeah, I, I I do like how he fits with the lineup. He seems very adaptable. He can play. He doesn't. He's not like restricted to like four or five heroes. You know, he seems to have a decent pool. So I I I I, I like their chances more after seeing them play uh, recently than I was thinking uh, before that. Okay, you're nice. All right. Well, I mean, down to the just say down it. to the meat and potatoes. As someone would once say. Some famous general probably said that. hate you more and more every week. I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. Take me back. Take Jeez me back. Louise. Um, The Dream League. Um, the finals. Spoiler alert. Uh, Alliance versus Cloud9. As I mentioned, it is going to be uh, a repeat match come up in the, the first set of games in uh, the ESL 1. What did you uh, think about the, the league in general? The mm-hmm. the finals, the games leading up to them. How'd you join? It was um, it was cool. Yeah, it was really nice. I uh, I definitely I think everyone that watched the grand finals definitely got their uh, got their fill of great Dota play back and forth. It's 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 it. It was so intense. It was so close. A lot of long games too. And it wasn't only like, hey, let's farm for forty five minutes and then do two Roshans and win the game. It was kind of some big back and forth fights that you didn't know who was going to end up winning because it was so close at times. So that's the best kind of dough. That's all you can hope for as a spectator. And uh, <clears throat> I was overall really impressed by the play of all these teams. I mean, you look at the the six that were invited: uh, Cloud Nine, Empire, EG, Mouse Sports, Fnatic, and Alliance. Uh, coming into this, uh, you know, an Alliance was eight and six, Fnatic eight and six, Cloud Nine team, Empire twelve and two uh, in the league standing. So they were obviously. Uh, I guess the the favored ones coming in here, um, but Alliance. I mean, they just played with this whimsy and this vigor, and they just played so well. And it was it was giving us that those flashbacks of Ti Ti three. You know, they were doing so good back then because you could tell they were all coordinated on the same page. And you know, seeing them play in this tournament was really like wow. They're they're really getting ready for Ti four. Yeah, this is. I feel like. You know, there were some talks about it coming up with all these land tournaments back to back, and we're, you know now we're pretty much in the thick of it. Um, I feel like you saw a level of skill out of not just uh, Cloud Nine and Alliance who find their way into the finals, but also in some of the other teams in the in the matches leading up to the finals. Body blocks, um, strong play all around. You know, I that. Especially like the seeing so many body blocks, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is like, are we at the international already? Like, people are already fast approaching." I feel like the their highest um, possible skill level, and we still have another land tournament to go before the international. You know, I, I'm curious to see how all the invited teams do at ESL mm-hmm. because part of the question was, you know, is fatigue going to be an issue? All these teams flying around, uh, playing such high skill games is it going to start to wear them out or are they going to be able to tough it out and then just come into the international um that much better poised don't know it'll be uh curious to see but um you know even just like another thing for the we got to see alchemist popping his ultimate to dodge skills i mean there were just so many amazing plays instant ravages uh by pilot eye to destroy io gank like oh just beautiful stuff all around which we'll definitely be talking to but i also gotta ask what you think about uh toby being there to cast i the loved it now yeah i'm glad you brought that up because i was telling you i uh i thought he honestly was the perfect fit with uh with lumi and with draskal i mean they, they they've they've kind of had everything of all worlds you got draskal who's obviously king of game knowledge right he's got so much to bring to the table uh, with his vast experience with Dota. Um, Lumi's kind of like a hype guy who's really cool, but he also actually knows a good amount too. So he's got like a really good mix there. And then Toby's obviously 99% hype and the 1% random fact that everyone's like, oh yeah, I guess that is true, Toby. Good job, you know, gold star. But, you know, for the most part, Toby's obviously the really great commentator who's going to give you the play-by-play in a really good fashion. Uh, I know a lot of people have mixed feelings on his delivery. 
Um, but, you know, I feel like he's really worked to improve himself since uh, the past couple years. And I honestly think, you know, when I when I see three casters, I think that's too much. I'm like, I love two generally because they play off each other. You and I, of course, perfect, right? Oh. Uh, perfect, you know, <laughs> flawless essentially. But, you know, the third person, I'm like, it's kind of like a third wheel on a date or something. I'm like, when are they going to interject? You know, you got the, the guy that's giving the general color commentary. You've got the guy who's playing the call. So where is this third guy coming in? But they made it work really smoothly. I barely saw people speaking over each other. They knew when to cut off when a you know big action was coming up. I thought it was really well done. Yeah, I mean that is interesting. I mean there has been actually a lot of I feel like try casting lately, a lot more than I feel like the normal dual setup. I I came into this quite suspicious of Toby, and um, this is actually uh, when I was you know poking around, joined Dota, looking at some of the articles and stuff. They did have this uh, interview with uh, Moon Meander, who is apparently was playing Han professionally and dropped it to start playing Dota. But anyway, in the interview, um, he mentioned that they were talking about the number of high-profile tournaments that are getting played and how, like, all of these Tier 1 teams are playing, like, all the time and how not only does that make it difficult for some of these Tier 2, Tier 3 teams to uh, get their chance in the spotlight to sort of show the world what they can do and to try to build a base. Because also, like, you know, so many casters are just sort of burnt out or they're they're hyped out they can't be excited it seems like for a lot of these things because they're just always casting these high level games they're always casting the same teams they sort of get used to seeing um certain things out of certain teams mm. um but you know i i feel like the less not less serious stuff that toby casts but some of the stuff he's just done or you know he's just shown up for a game or whatever it's i hate it normally i was fine with him for the uh, the finals here, but you know, I, I yeah, I thought they did a good job. Really, everybody that was a part of the, the yeah. production did really stellar. It felt a little less trolly than I feel like some of the other stuff that the good studios helped put on. Yeah, I thought Two GD and Shano Mad also brought some really good things to the table at the uh, you know when they had their roundtable discussions or whatever after the games were done. You know, it, it's just that's kind of something I've liked about the GD Studio, uh, Two GD Studio, or whatever. Is that uh, you know, they just they have a, a great little uh, interaction. It's uh, it's not completely professional, obviously, because if you have two GD in there, it's not going to be a completely professional performance. So that's what he brings. He brings his personality, which is a really great one to have. Um, you know, there's a reason he's hosted the event multiple times, <laughs> TI4 or TI in general. But um, yeah, I, I I thought that the the studio itself did a phenomenal job. Uh, Wepus, you have to give him complete credit here, being the dedicated cameraman. For those games, that's a lot of hours looking around, spectating a game. And not only that, but you have to basically follow around the casters and try to see what they're seeing. And also, on top of that, he was going around checking items, kind of hovering over it to give the casters something to talk about. Like, he really did such a great job. And that's, I, I can only believe that that would be a really, not only, not boring, but you know what I mean, like tedious task to have to do because you, you don't really get to talk about it. You're just literally following the action around. Yeah, that's true too because, and I, I think you even mentioned last episode, you know, sometimes you'll like see in the tournaments that have been happening recently where the cast will be like, oh yeah, and what's what's Shakiro got? And they're just like clicking away, you know, doing their thing and looking right. around the map. Oh, oh what? Sorry, you need a, <laughs> okay, Shakiro, here he is. Here's what he's doing. Um, so yeah, no, you did a, a fantastic job. What do you think? I mean, let's get your, in your meat and potatoes, Jay. Oh, I can't wait. Alliance Cloud Nine. How excite hype were you? How who did you who did you like coming into this? I mean, did you have a favorite? This is the thing. Uh, coming well, okay, coming into the tournament, let me just say, I was completely shocked, and I think I was the only one that EG just poofed out, like. We were all, I think a lot of us were riding on an EG high recently. They, they've seen that really have their shit together. And they just get they just get beaten all over the place in this tournament. And that was really surprising. So I just wanted to say that. Did you, were you, do you agree with that? Did you expect them to do more than that? I feel like I, I'm not like, I wasn't like, holy crap, Alliance and C9 made it to the finals. But no. I was like, oh, these aren't necessarily who I would expect to get there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you mentioned, like uh, Empire doing really well throughout the whole tournament. Um, and you know what, this feels like, they're leading up to this, there have been some times where like, okay, when are like Alliance and some of these other teams going to come online? 
they're they're on. <laughs> they've they've clearly turned on, and um, I feel like the quality of the games that we played that were played were just really amazing. A lot of really interesting strats, some interesting heroes being picked up, mm-hmm. and, and you mentioned a change in the most picked hero of the tournament. Yeah, so I you know it's really interesting. I love pulling up the stats afterwards uh, of these tournaments and. Number one, uh, I would ask you to guess, but we've already done this game off the mm-hmm. air. So, you know what? What's your guess? What would you think number one is if you just had to blindly take a leap of faith here? I'd say probably either Meepo or Io. Probably. Probably one, one of those. Of those. Yeah, mm-hmm. you've got a good odd there. You've got good odds. Yeah, so uh, by process of elimination, Io being the number one here, uh, not in win rate by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, in terms of selection here, uh, 13 games played. Uh, pretty phenomenal. Actually tied with Doom, who had a slightly better win rate. So Io actually four and nine on the on the whole event, uh, not ideal. But yeah, it 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 was it kind of threw me off a bit. I mean, you, you go down the list of the rest of the picks. It's everyone else you kind of expect, you know, Tide, Brew Tree, and Marana. But you know, to see the Io up there. Oh, and Jakiro at six, which I think we have one team to really thank for that one. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you think uh, Io? There's a reason he kind of made his way back in this tournament. I think um, they're just Io's play style is about great decision making, about being mobile. Uh, we've seen him. I feel like change from being all about the the combo, all about the gank, to seeing defensive Io, to seeing. Some players even using relocate for very short range just to reposition, give their teammate just a chance to get their head in the game for the team fight that mm-hmm. the other team has tried to engage on. He has really you know, just shown himself to be a hero that top teams can utilize really well. And that's something I think that is true about this whole series is that the lineups that come out are a lot about being highly mobile, having long-range initiation, um, and really giving the players plenty of opportunity to um, make sure that they are positioned exactly they want to be, that they can come together when they want to come together, um, so that they don't spend a lot of time, oh, well, I guess we have to sit and farm for a bit because we kind of don't have an opportunity. Alliance, especially throughout this series, there were... uh, many times when they were on their back foot and you would just see, okay, we're just going to make sure that we're putting in a couple hits on all these towers. We're going to stay split up um, and try to keep pressure everywhere when, we have to, when we're feeling on our back foot so that there wasn't really this, okay, well, now we can group up and push and take a tower and there's going to be no repercussion uh, from C9. Uh, Alliance just did a really great job, I think, especially this the series, um, just always being productive and always moving around efficiently. Yeah, and that's what I was kind of saying. They were kind of going back to their TI3 days where it was almost hive mindish in a way. You know, they they knew exactly what had to happen. And this is where Admiral Bulldog, of course, being on his strength, got to play Nature's Prophet. Uh, I know at least the majority of the games, I didn't actually add it up total, but I would have to guess at least three of these five games he played Nature's Prophet. Uh, and obviously, anyone that knows his name, which I hope you do by now, 92 episodes in here. Um, but, you know, he's just, he's he's amazing at this hero. He does so well with it. He knows exactly when to come in with his team, when not to come in with his team, when to split push at the right times. And I think the favorite thing, I know my favorite thing, and I'm going to get get your opinion on it. It seems the majority of the games he played, particularly in the Grand Finals, um... He wasn't going that hand to Midas build that we would see a lot of times. Instead, he would go um, into uh, a Maelstrom and Blink Dagger uh, really early, and then eventually Sheep Stick. But uh, this is obviously instead of a Shadow Blade. So, what do you think with the Blink Dagger in regards to uh, you know like a Shadow Blade uh, hand to Midas kind of build? I, I, so I think the hand of Midas you can totally say is. Um, not obsoleted by, but I've sort of been thinking about this before even seeing this series. Why would you ever not get Maelstrom on Nature's Prophet? Mm-hmm, right. It really is an item that feels so perfect for him, it's not even funny. It's something that helps you push faster. Something that helps you farm faster. 
Um, if you need to transition to a late game carry, cool. Now you have an item that helps you pump out the deeps. Yeah. Even if you don't, being able to have an item that does increase your farm but doesn't leave you weaker in team fights like Midas would um, feels so perfect. The Blink Dagger is weird and interesting, mm -hmm. and I feel like I'm still kind of out on this one. I think, though, when you compare it to items like Shadow Blade can be countered by dust. They can hunt you down with the gem if they want to. You're, at the end of the day, going to be somewhere where they're going to be able to get you unless you're able to lock yourself in a sprout. Um, the Blank Dagger really does let you get to somewhere you're not able to get to. And I know this before the show started up, when we were briefly talk talking, you were mentioning mm -hmm. just the reaction time of all these players. Yeah. If you're able to just be like, oh, something happened, blink away into the trees, and then I'm going to TP out, then yeah, it makes perfect sense. Right, and you know the uh, the the greatest use of this blink dagger was absolutely <clears throat> was uh, in game three uh, when he was playing uh, <clears throat> playing his nature's prophet. You know he was they were against a team that ha were running a bunch of BKBs, and uh, you know the the best way to counter that is to get that crowd control on them before they get to use their BKB. Simple as that. And so you know with that reaction time, he'd be you know teleport to let's say the woods above top lane. And then he'd blink and lane sheep when the rest of his team's coming from the jungle. Um, and they get the pick off because of the blink initiation. So it's almost in a way like Puck <laughs> with that kind of initiation. Obviously, not with the rest of the package that Puck brings. But then again, Puck can't TP around the map. So you get, get both worlds there. But um, yeah, I, I was really uh, intrigued by it. But Blink Dagger's obviously been just cropping up over heroes that you didn't expect it on before purely for the after its buff, it's just become a really solid item. You know, there's no denying that it's just effective on almost every hero regardless. Even snipers, drows, anyone that can get their hands on it can find a way to use it usually pretty effectively. Maybe not anti-mage. Maybe not. But, uh, you know, regardless. Um, yeah, I... I've, uh, I've, I've, well... Blink Dagon, proven anti-mage strat. I don't know what you're talking refresher about. Refresher for double ulties. I mean, any of these things happen. Maybe not Diffusal Blade anti-mage, but you know you can dream um that's a little off topic but yeah I, I i i really did like it and i you know i i guess i see both four staff and blink dagger being good items on him depending on what you need um shadow blade i completely agree especially in the pro level uh players have many ways usually to detect you whether it's sentries and dust and whatever so it's generally not the safest bet when you're trying to split push but blink dagger uh, with your reaction time, usually should be enough to get you out safe and sound, or initiate, like I was just saying. And that's yeah, and you know, even in the game where he doesn't get sheep stick, he has orchid, so it's still the same principle of blinking, and then you're able to silence to stop somebody from being able to get away or stop them from getting off their spells. And you know, I feel like it's in the same vein. And in that respect, yeah, I think it it made a lot of sense, and I definitely. I, if something would have to change, I feel like, about the item uh, for me to not like Maelstrom being an almost guaranteed pickup on a profit. You know, there are always going to be those situations where you go, no, 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 really need the Necronomicon, really need the mech, really need X, Y, or Z. But that to me, I, it feels like a really standard um, item choice. And if you're like playing Nature's Profit and you're normally not into them, not really sure what to build, I feel like there is never a bad time for it. <laughs> It might not be your best choice at, at in any game, but I always feel like it's at least a good one. No, absolutely. It, like you said, it just it completely uh, complements his kit and what he's trying to accomplish in a game. So, uh, anyway, so uh, I guess we could just kind kind of go through the games as we will, as we want to here. Uh, it was a best of five, and by golly, it went through all five. So, like I said, it was a really exciting matchup. Uh, these two teams really evenly matched for the most part. Uh, definitely different play styles, of course, and that's what got them there. But uh, in the end result, uh, Alliance taking the cake through all games. But like I said, it was back and forth. Literally each game was a different victory. 1-0, one, 1-1, one 2-1, to 2-2, one, 3-2. To one, two to one, two to two, two. I mean, it was kind of amazing in that regard. Yeah, it was definitely an entertaining series. And the thing that I liked a lot about it, too, was when you get to these grand finals, um... I feel like a lot of the games tend to go slower. They tend to be safer. 
I feel like that was the exact opposite. I think there was like one game where it was sort of like almost a kill a minute, but everything else, I feel like it was it wound up being more um, really only. Uh, I think in one of the games was there really a time where everything just sort of stopped and slowed down, and the teams just sort of took their time. Other than that, it was really just the throttle the whole way, and you know, like you said these teams got here in different ways and I think you really got to see the kind of strategies um, that played each of their strengths. I mean, apparently S4 just continues to deliver finals wins on the back of Puck um, and then employing the the global presence of the admirable Dog Nation Prophet and IO mm-hmm. and C9, I mean, using the Jakiro, really making um, great use of this hero. Would it what were your thoughts on him? Because I believe in all of the games, at least in most of them that he was seeing, Liquid Fire wound up getting maxed first, which, you know, I can't hate it. You, uh, you can, actually, if you wanted oh, to. Oh, I can't. Oh, it's well, me. maybe you. Maybe it's not possible. Deep in my soul, I can't. For, <laughs> for someone like you, but I just found it intriguing. You know, you don't see that hero getting picked up in this day and age. He's uh, He's been one of the supports that's kind of been sidelined for most of the time, and despite getting... Uh, I don't know if I even want to call him buffs recently. You know, getting the kind of changes made to dual breath and uh, whatnot. I mean, yeah, the uh, the liquid fire DPS slightly increasing and things like that. But uh, I don't know. I just I think it would it made a lot of sense in a lot of lineups. It's obviously a really great uh, crowd control, and he and whenever he could, he went that Yules to uh, Cyclone and then followed up with an Ice Path for the really good lockdown. Uh, you know, in the damage, uh, pushing towers made so much easier. Obviously, that liquid fire—it's one of the one of the greater tools to slow that tower attack speed of fifty percent. Um, but I just I just don't know if he does enough. I feel like you really need uh, to make great use of his macro pyre to really make him really effective. Which means Roche pit fighting or having heroes on your team that can kind of either Enigma or Mag- Mag- Magnus-esque heroes, you know, that pull him into a location. But uh, he made it work, and he obviously Ice Path King. I'll give Allie that. He could definitely land them like no one else. Yeah, I Allie, you know, Rod of Allie, um, here, here we go again with him sort of taking an item that doesn't really get used a whole lot, making it his own, <laughs> and making really great use of it. Um, you know, like you said, using the Yules to help set up ice pads and then even in the games against Kunkka using it to break the X marks the spot so really a great usage of the item and um, I feel like the Jakiro is a pretty viable pick just because of I think you get uh, a lot of things out of it that you might not necessarily get out of the other sports you know the long range initiation if you get the Yules he's not the slowest uh, hero by any means he can move around pretty effectively using the another uh, thing those need to notice about how Ali was playing him using the macro pyre sometimes to just farm with um helping to get him mm-hmm. himself up that yules or uh, moving into another item so I, I thought it was really neat and refreshing to see you know a uh, strategy a hero you know sort of like Mouse's troll warlord this hero that cloud nine really seems to enjoy running um and I don't know that I feel like he needs to have a coupler to ensure that the macro pyre is able to sit there for a long time and do a lot of damage. But, uh, you know, I definitely do like that combo when people are able to to bring it up. Pull it off successfully. Yeah, I mean, he's got some good slows with the ice path. The dual breath and liquid fire should not be underrated, especially liquid fire. Like he said, when it's maxed out, it's a five second uh, or four second cooldown, excuse me. Um, really easy to kind of spam out in the fight, and it does do that splash. So it's it's really nice, and I I don't know I, I really appreciate it. Um, but I just like I said, it I think the other great thing is that he's so damn tanky. Like it, you know, a lot of supports just super squish, get a couple of nukes, and they're down. He takes a lot. He's kind of like the arranged ogre magi in that kind of sense, where he's like, I don't really need items to. Uh, to you know, tank up and be able to participate in the fight without having to be a mile back. You know, I can be up on the front lines, try to land my spells, and not be worried about the instant burst uh, burst issue. Yeah, and uh, apparently two heads is a signifier of being tanky in Dota 2. I didn't really think about that, but 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I think that's even another great um, example of why Yules is, I think, a fantastic item. Because I think once you are playing this hero a lot, you can time the Yules with the Dual Breath or the Ice Path or both. And you saw a lot of the times where he would just sort of lay out that combo of Yules, Ice Path, Macro Pyre, the Dual Breath. So if, even if they weren't able to sit in a macro pyre, he was able to make sure that he was making contact with it when he used it in team fights. So it was really great. But they did get to do in that game four. They got the faceless Jakiro combo. And that, that's that's the prime example of where I really love seeing Jakiro. Because, you, yeah, you lay down that macro in uh, Chrono, uh, kind of like Variant in our chat's pointing out. It is just phenomenal, and it's uh, it's fun to watch. Yeah, and I think that's another thing that makes me like the, um, or uh, just to go back to the Yule thing, because I'm just thinking about some more, this ensuring that your spells are able to hit versus needing something like a Chrono to set it up, because I feel like we've seen a couple games where it's like, oh, I'm going to go Aghanim's first on Jakiro, and it's going to be great, and my fire's going to be all over the place. <laughs> But you would sometimes like, oh, I missed it and threw it the wrong way. Or, okay, I laid it down and the other team just just spread out. <laughs> I really kind of do like the idea of just going that Yules, making sure you have a nice path land, making sure you're at least doing a little bit of the damage with all of your abilities. And I, I really like that Aoi used an unconventional item on an unconventional hero and really um, utilized it well in the grand finals of a major land tournament. It's awesome. Absolutely. But let's... Let's go into the games. Game one, nothing out of the ordinary here. Completely normal, regular stuff. Lotus Fen, Alchemist Middle. I mean, might as well go into game two. Pretty standard. Pretty, pretty oh, stable. and Scotty first, Ember Spirit. Kind of expected. I mean, I called that in the draft pretty much. <laughs> what did you think about this game? Did it blow your mind? Were you... Did, were you ready to receive the other games after this one? I was just very confused for many, 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 many reasons. I I had low hopes for Cloud9 after this one. Um, oh. Yeah, to say the least. Uh, you know, my first thought was like, oh, Sven versus uh, Ember Spirit. Who's the better cleaver? You know, because generally Ember Spirit's going to build that uh, Battle Fury, maybe Maelstrom, whatever. He's going to AoE like a champ. Uh, this game... He does not do that, like you said. Goes for the Scotty, which just really blew my mind. You know, we saw uh, Draskal was commenting on this. He he built he got an Orb of Venom really early, and he's like, "Oh, that's actually really cool. You get to apply that debuff to people. You know, it's gonna get that slow type of damage tick. That's a pretty cool idea. You know, it's cheap too. Why not? Uh, then he got a point booster, and everyone's like, "Is is he doing that?" Like, is that... Bloodstone Ember Spear. Is Why? that a thing? And, uh... Sure enough, throughout the game, he was trying to get... He got... I think he ended up getting one more ultimate orb, but he didn't get to finish it by the end of it. But, uh... Yeah, going for that... Going for that Scotty, like, first. Uh... It just seems strange. You know, you... you I mean, you... Okay, you look what you're against, right? You're against the Treant, the Nature's Prophet, the Io, Sven, and Puck. So, obviously, Sven... Is going to be tearing through you. If you can get a slow on him, that helps. But he's going to be attacking fast regardless. With Iowa Mask of Madness, I mean, this guy is going to be plowing through people no matter what. Um, I, it just felt like a very bizarre thing. Also, his skill build, which I think actually made sense. But he didn't really level Sleight of Fist until post-7. You know, he maxed out uh, his Flame Guard to, I guess, farm jungle stacks, push the lane. Uh, also get that Magic Shield going for the stuns and whatnot. But yeah, not even like a single point until later to even try to set up stun, uh, try to set up his uh, roots. So I don't know. Overall, I, I'm just right now focusing on the the Ember. What did you think about his item and skill build? Uh, I I think you're on the right track with the skill build thing. And if you're not gonna go like a drums or a battle fury or a maelstrom, how are you supposed to farm? Well, I think it is off the back of the uh, the flame garden. Also. You know, I think this is a game where he really had to try to be tanky to at least some of the damage. Obviously, a lot of it's going to come from Loda. It's going to be physical damage. Uh, Admiral Bulldog is going to be pumping out a lot of physical damage as well. But at least he was able to try to use that to shrug off some of the damage from S4 playing the puck. Um, 
as well as you know some of the nature's profit ultimate damage but you know i i get it because he had to be tanky i get it because he wanted to apply it an attack speed slow movement speed slow i like i kind of understand but the way that they just left Lodo alone it wasn't that they left him alone for like you know 15 minutes or 20 minutes i want to say it was less than 10 Mm -hmm. he's able to get the the midas up he's able to get the um treads up and then he just sort of is already ready to participate and he just goes out of control um i think the the biggest part of this game is the two failed roche attempts which i think are hilarious for one reason in particular way back in ancient history uh isama the roche timer a guy that was all about cooldowns and knowing exactly when things were going to be ready to optimize on the map goes in with his team once and fails and then they miscalculate the cooldown timings of alliance's heroes by the time they go back there the second time i really i liked it in theory i'm like oh yeah they just blew everything go back in but <laughs> look at the heroes they're dealing with i mean tree protector the dream coil was up already they pretty much had everything they needed to go back and initiate an s4 i mean the the first fight at the roche pit i believe he just jumps in lays down a beautiful dream coil does a ton of damage and i you know torment winning dream coils have been seen before yes. by s4 so um you know i really did i have to say i think that this game sometimes in these best of five scenarios i feel like game one is a wash people just tend to like sort of bring out weird strategies um you know i feel like this game while there were some weird picks there it was there was some interesting stuff going on it really felt solid um it really felt pretty consistent and it also i mean it was constant action constant movement but it wasn't mindless like all of it felt really well coordinated really well thought out and you know egm was just i think playing out of his mind this game um he was like always linked up always overcharging whenever teammates were taking damage and i mean when you go later on and we start talking about the io on the other side of the board you saw some times where you're like why do he blow up so oh, overcharges and on? So, mm-hmm. you know, if the, oh, he wasn't tethered up to the IO. They weren't able to keep him alive. Mm-hmm. The best timings of TPing people out and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, EGM in general in this whole series played really, really well. Um, but, yeah, I agree. It was, uh, I mean, the IO Sven, that actually kind of was like an old school strat back in the day. It's one of those really nasty, I mean, Sven's one of those heroes where obviously he's all about brute force, uh, can get carried around by certain lineups, but uh, you know if he's able to stay in that melee range, he is going to just utterly destroy your team, which he clearly did on multiple occasions. You know they had great combos with him. You know you got the treat, you got the puck to lock everyone down so they can't really run away, and uh, at that point he just pops God's strength and mask of madness and just cleaves away. You know he ended up three or four shot. I remember top lane. I believe it was a four or five man, maybe it was a four man smoke gank. Uh, and they, they caught the Sven and Io by themselves top. And they really tried their darndest to kill these two. But with the tether, with the overcharge, they were able to turn around and like almost kill, I believe they killed two of them at least. It was brutal. I'm like, how did that happen? <laughs> you know, it's just the pure strength of that combination. And Sven getting to p- fight uh, and get to attack people in range. That's what's going to happen, you know? And if you're grouped up, God help you. Because you're going to get Sven stunned in a group and then cleaved and you're dead. Yeah, I mean, that was a great example of where it was like Tether overcharge immediately. He was able to soak up enough damage. He was able to turn around, pop God strength, and just start wailing on them. And because they did leave him alone, he was able to um, get all those creep kills in the bottom lane um, pretty much uncontested. It really just help him blow the game wide open and... Um, I think that's just a great example of, you know, uh, EGM's execution on the Wisp uh, in this game and, you know, in following ones as well. So, I mean... Yeah, but it was the Roche fights. You're completely right. That kind of was the turning point. I think it was the Roche fights and maybe 
maybe some item choices on C9 side. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying Battle Fairy would have been better here, because it probably wouldn't have been. But I'm, I'm not sure what would have been better, but I just felt like Scotty was just too slow. I feel like it took him... I don't Honestly, I don't think he finished it. If he did, it was clearly like the very end of the game where he finished it. So it just took too long to get all those... All two orbs are so expensive. It's a really big expenditure, and you're not getting a lot out of it. So to get an item like Scotty, you're putting so many resources into getting it. And I think it was just too little too late. You know, by the time he would have gotten it, Sven was out of control. And the slow effect was really going to be minimal in helping them. So, uh, But that's obviously not the whole reason they lost. I'm just saying, I, I just feel like there was a combination of things that really made C9 fall flat here. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Sven was picked late in the draft. I mean, it's not a high priority, so of course you can save him for last. But I mean, you, you look at C9's lineup and you go, yeah, they're they're trying to get by on um, Eternal Envy on the Ember Spirit, able to do enough damage, and if you're just able to tear through him, I mean, that's a squishy hero. I mean, what what could you have done better? I mean, you're saying, like, the Battle Fury wouldn't have worked, and I agree with you. If he, what if he goes Drums Lincolns, takes too long, not doing enough damage at that point? Uh, because Sing Sing wasn't going to be doing it on the Alchemist, because he winds up just going for the Medallion and the Halberd. So there, there really Honestly, was. Honestly, I think Drums and uh, Chrysalis would have been the way I would have tried to build him. I think the Drums gives you the tankiness that you're looking for from the Point Booster, um, from the Scotty that he was getting, um, and I think the Chrysalis would have given maybe that extra damage he needed to really try to eat through this team. Uh, that's what I would have suggested. Uh, otherwise, though, I mean, like I said, that was just an uphill fight for him anyway. So there wasn't anything perfect. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I think the extra damage in the, the drum may have helped his team more than uh, these incomplete items that he had just kind of tossed around. So I don't know. At the end of the day, like we were saying, it, it, it wasn't going to matter too much. It was the Roche things that really just destroyed them here, trying to sneak it in. Going back for seconds, so greedy. You know, like you said, you think the timing, you should kind of figure out that that took too long to get back there. But they're in this tiny area against Sven and Puck, right? I think you're going to get AoE down pretty severely. And Alchemist, another interesting pick here. I know we're spending a lot of time in game one, but, you know, you don't see him a lot these days. And, you know, going mid against a, going mid against a Puck, obviously not going to stop Puck from farming in any regard. It's going to be kind of a mutual farm fest, if you will. But, I mean, he just kept getting destroyed over and over. Uh, even with that uh, chemical rage on, it was not nearly enough regen um, from the, the burst damage coming out from Sven and these other heroes. So, I mean, do you think that was another reasoning that they they had trouble this game? I don't... I don't hate it because it was C9's last pick. And, uh, you know, going for the Heaven's Halberd, I think, is was uh, in theory a great way to try to deal with Loda, but it just didn't pan out. Right. Um, you know, if you see on the other side of the board that you need some tank ability, that's a good way to go, but that's not going to be giving you um, the HP bonus that it used to. So I, I don't know. I just I don't think they really had a great answer for Loda, and, you know, they also didn't try to, to hold him down in the early game, so they really just sort of let him uh, make it Alliance's game. Yeah, so we can move on. That was a that was a good good synopsis of game one, I think. Uh, and probably one of the shorter games of the series. In that uh, oh, the well, last comment I say is uphill miss op. Yes, I'm trying to remember exactly what that was, but oh wait, oh yes, <laughs> yes, Admiral Bulldog porting in on Dark Seer. Yes, not being able to get the kill. Uh, it was so rude, but it was so great. Uh, oh. Yes, that was so beautiful. Thank you for reminding me of that. Because I think that is exactly... That's another great example of just the level of play to come out because the map awareness of Admiral Bulldog in the first place, to have they had the ward there, they knew Darkseer is going to be in the jungle, so they're looking for him at that camp. Admiral Bulldog, has a present, he's looking around the map, he sees it going on, he TPs in. When things start to not go his way, tries to run out through the river, makes trees so that he, the chances of him being... Uh, chained by Ember Spirit are lower. I mean, I think just that whole setup there and the way that then the teams came together to fight uh, just north of the, the mid lane was just a great example of the level of play that both of these teams were putting out. Sorry. Go. 
And I go! Now, that. That, you're oh. welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. For all of that I yeah. probably gave to you. Um, So, game two. Alliance. Oh, leader. there were other games. Oh, Sorry. my lord. Are you done? Are you yeah. done? Never done. So, yes, there were other games. Four more to be specific. So we're going to not hopefully spend that much time. Oh, maybe we will. Three hours. We'll see how long this episode lasts. But, uh, yeah, so going into game two here. Uh, pretty interesting in that. Uh, the, the picks coming out, Cloud9 went their brew. Uh, Nyx, Disruptor, Tinker, and Jakiro. That was a safe lane to Tinker, mid-brew. Um, and then Alliance went uh, Shadow D. Murata. Oh, I've never seen that combo before. Uh, Slark, Skyrath, and Kunkka. So Skyrath being a support this game. Um, yeah, what, what's your initial thoughts of these lineups? Jakiro again. So clearly, yep. um, as we mentioned, something that Cloud9 enjoys running and Aoi using the Yule Scepter goes for Heaven's Albert as well as a BKB. Hilarious. Um, no, but I think, you know, good item choices. And Bone7 even winds up building a Yule's. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they were doing a great job of using that to help disjoint the X marks the spot by uh, S4's Kunkka. Skyrath Mage, I thought was really cool. I am definitely looking forward to seeing more of them. Um, and there was actually an interview with um, No Tail where he said that he thought that, you know, Skyrath Mage was one of the sort of underappreciated heroes of the patch. And I think this game um, also shows you and can. Just going along the lines of the, the style of hero that Skyrath Mage is, how much emphasis these teams are putting on mobile heroes. You have Tinker mm -hmm. on one side of the board, it's going to be TPing around everywhere. You have the Nyx Assassin that's going to be running around like crazy, helps set up a lot of fights with the Blink Dagger as well. On the other side of the board, you have Mr. Artillery, the Skyrath Mage. You have the Long Range Arrows. You have the Sniping Ghost Ship, which like uh, S4 got a kill <laughs> in the middle lane with. And then Admiral Bulldog going, one. yeah. And then Admiral Bulldog, Blink Dagger, Slark. So, so much mobility. The Slink. The Slink. The Slink is real. TM. The Slink, slink is dream. real. Uh, I, I just, I just couldn't believe. I, I felt so bad for Sing Sing this game. His brew mid. It's not like he played a bad brew. Uh, it's just the fact that. Uh, he was against the Shadow Demon with Kunkka. And uh, Shadow Demon had, like, both of his favorite pals on his team. He had Mirana and Kunkka. So he's like, all right, I can go pretty much any lane and set up a kill for whoever I want. This is fantastic. You know, he went mid multiple times and would just do the disruption. And, of course, Alliance timing is impeccable, you know. And he would get the Soul Catcher down. And by the time he got out, there was no time for the Primal Split. It was a Torrent followed by the Ghost Ship. And he was dead. Just purely dead from that burst damage with the Soul Catcher alone. Um, it was a great way to lock him down. I also like Skywrath against Brewmaster, obviously. Um, able to, you know, try to ensure that he can't get that ulti off. Because obviously a Brew without an ulti makes him way less effective. Um, so, you know, they, they really had some strong plays against him middle. But this Tinker, they allowed him to really free farm. He really got out of hand at this point. And not only did he do well, EE played a great tinker, but he did a lot of cutting creep waves. Um, and for those who aren't really familiar with that terminology, uh, essentially you're going behind enemy lions, so behind the towers, you're not fighting with your creeps. And he just cleared out the waves by doing March Machines multiple times, and he'd TP out from the woods. So played it safe, but able to uh, keep the lanes uh, not push towards his base. So Alliance had a lot, a hard time really pressuring the uh, C9 base just because their creep waves always seem to be, uh, you know, back near their towers instead of their opponents. Yeah, and this was a game that I felt like really from the get-go, C9 were making Alliance adjust. There were a lot, of ro a lot of rotation coming out from the supports to try to figure out how they wanted to work the lanes, how to get them... Um, situated the way they wanted to something to point out between the game one and game two a lot of smoke usage too mm. um which is always fantastic to see and yeah i mean just to go to what c9 were able to do it was it was almost like a four protect one strat except it was like four people were running around making space for tinker to run around and make space um they were just able to keep pressure out on the map constantly with the the pushing from the tinker and the team fight from the other four um 
It was, though, I mean, a close game for, I feel like, as hard of a time yeah. um, as the Lions had in the beginning. I know. I mean, it was really close, but the thing is, is this Tinker got out of control. That, and Tinker is one of those heroes that played well, which obviously the pro scene is going to happen. Uh, like, for example, 28 minutes in, Tinker had 16,500 net worth. The next highest was Moran at 10,000. 6,500 net worth difference at 28 minutes is substantial. That's more than a sheep stick in net worth difference. I mean, he was just going crazy. And he, he went a Tinker build that was really perfect for the game. Because, you know, a lot of times you'll see maybe a quick E-Blade Dagon or something along those lines. He went for the sheep stick plank, which obviously is pretty stable. But then he went Shiva's and Bloodstone. So going for more of that uh, continuous fighting, so not having to burst, TP out, come back in. He could keep rearming, sheeping, doing what he needed to do. And and uh, the Shiva's obviously for the slow against the team was very helpful. And uh, I just I thought it was a really strong play. And you know he at times uh, he did die a couple really important times in the fight, but the Bloodstone helped him come back that much quicker. And, uh, you know, towards the end of the game, there was really nothing they could do against him. He was all over the place, sheeping left and right. And uh, he really carried this one on his shoulders, which, like you said, is a four protect one strat. So he did his job in this game. Yeah, I mean, I even wrote down, um, you know, 33 minutes. He had almost twice as much farm as the next person. I think it was like 20,000 to 11,000 um, by the slink. Uh, God, I'm never going to stop using that term. <laughs> um, it's ours. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah, and the other thing that I really liked about this game was that, you know, sometimes I feel like you get a lane and it's not necessarily, you know, the nail in the coffin. But this game was, I feel like, so close that having just that one lane of Rax down really helped make the difference. And you saw, you know, the Tier 4 falling uh, to just the creeps because of the the pacing of these games and the, the whole series. As you said, it wasn't that they were playing super safe and back and, you know, playing defensive and farming up. They were engaging each other all over the map that really having that one lane of racks down, I think, made a, a big impact and really helped Cloud9 seal the deal. It did. And the, the March Machines, when you've got heroes like Shadow Demon and Skywrath, they are like what I'm talking about. They're the opposite of Jakiro. They're very squishy mid to late game, um, you know, unless they got some ridiculous kills early game or something, which, of course, they didn't. And, uh, you know, uh, EE would just go in there blink near the back of the end lines, drop a couple marches, and Skyrath, while having a far range, still needs to be at least in somewhat kind of a proximity, and Shadow Demon obviously needs to get kind of close and personal for a couple of his spells, and, uh, it, you know, they just really couldn't participate in the level I think they wanted to, purely based on March Machine zoning. It was really something magical, and uh, this really, you know, game one was like, oh, God, C9, what are you doing? This is, this is not looking good. Game two, I'm like, oh, Here's C9. This is what I remember. And it was brought the game. They brought it back one to one after that. Yeah, I want to say I. It was, I was nice. It was nice to see Skyrath. I feel like you really didn't get to appreciate him um, a whole lot. Um, you know, Lotus mentioned that he feels like a lot of this meta game is about t durable, tanky team fight heroes. I think Skyrath's a good answer to that because you can silence the team fight, like you were mentioning uh, with Brewmaster. He was able to lay down some arcane barrages that were able to do a ton of damage to tanky heroes. But I, I feel like there was no particular time where I'm like, yeah, Skyrath, good job. Um, but I guess the same token, Disruptor did fine, but you know there were no like super Disruptor plays. I feel like th it's still for teams to figure out what to do with that Skyrath mage to really make them mm -hmm. effective. I totally see, like, if you're able to disrupt Soul Catch, drop the Barrage, like, that's insane, and I wish we could have uh, saw some more of that, but, um, you know, I I totally expect to see more of him in the tournaments coming up, and hopefully to a little bit more success. Dendi, uh, Skyrath mid, gonna come back, probably. He he did also go the, um, the missile, the Pew Pew Flying Bird, a level one instead of conch shot or the silence, which I thought was really interesting. Oh, that's what I wanted to ask you about. Yeah, he maxed the arcane bolt over the uh, over the, the over the silence uh, I, ancient seal. What I know you personally don't prefer that, right? The, but I feel like the silence in general in the magic amp is so much more beneficial early game than the arcane bolt because they have the damage from this lineup. There's no question there. So, do you really think the spamming of the arcane bolt was worth it? I don't think so. 
Um, he was able to get the arcane boots up, but I, the the majority of what you're getting out of um, putting points in the arcane bolt to me is the the cooldown reduction, so you're able to get right. multiples of them out. But this uh, mana cost is um, static. It's not super expensive, but I don't know. I definitely like prioritizing the seal and against to the be brew honest, and tinker. I think those extra couple seconds of silence could make a big difference. <laughs> And to be honest, I even like putting more than one point in the conch shot just to get the cooldown lower. Um, the damage up, it's not a huge increase, but um, it, it's a pretty decent one. And it's nice to try to get more than just the... You know, have the potential to get more than one off in a fight. Mm -hmm. All right, game two. A little bit less time than game one, right? A little bit less. We'll, we'll get out here in another this couple hours, boys. Exactly like the our our patch <laughs> analysis. We get we get through like the first ten percent. We're like, okay, we gotta we gotta move these things. What do you think about? Uh... <laughs> and we just start going on like super <laughs> big discussions on very small details. But hey, that's what we do. That's kind of our thing. So, uh, game three, one to one, tied up. Good stuff. Now this game, I'm gonna describe as Alliance gets to pick their dream team. That's how oh. I kind of looked at this lineup. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that's just a good statement? That's pretty. That's pretty fair. I mean, I've, there's a lot of uh, familiar. There's a lot of you know. I mean, Admiral Bulldog, Nature's Prophet, Aki Chen. I feel like that's as alliance as you get. Um, yes, Loda I'm getting saying. play. The PA as well. Uh, S four mid tide hunter. Less than conventional, maybe. Yeah. Okay. And, and the side hunter. Um, I, the thing that I was really thrown off in this game was the off lane gyrocopter, which just completely destroyed Bulldog. I feel like he should have been able to do a little bit better. I kind of want to go back and watch the game again because he had like two creep kills, and I know flat cannon hurts, but I feel like you should be able to get more than two. <laughs> um, you know, he winds. He does a great job coming back, but I. You know, Eternal Envy, great player. Gyrocopter, great hero against Nature's Prophet. I get all that. But when you consider, like, how great, uh, you know, maybe even the best Nature's Prophet in the world to have such a hard time um, in that lane, it was, it was really... Uh, that was cool. Yeah. I, it caught me off guard that he was so shut down. Um, but it was really nice to see that they had the presence of mind to put the gyrocopter in that off lane, expecting the nature's profit uh, to be there. I think a really, really strong play. Get to see Pylai die on the IO. Um, so again, I feel like this was a game where you really got to maybe appreciate EGM's IO from game one a lot because there were times where there wasn't a link where eternal envy was overextended and out of, out of place and was able to get picked off, uh, took way too much damage um, and because apparently I'm just never going to stop talking. <laughs> nope. Um, I just have to say, S4 being on Tidehunter, I think is crazy, because not only is Tide coming back, but we get to see him in this series as, um, offlane, a support, and as a mid, and that is amazing. Yeah, it just shows how adaptable and how versatile he is. I mean... Uh, you know, depending on the matchup, of course, uh, you know, he, he, he did just fine, and uh, it wasn't necessarily his farm or his items. I mean, of course, late game, that didn't make a difference to be able to get into his refresher orb and whatnot. But I, I just thought it was just something, you know, something else to watch him play. Uh, this hero that, like you said, this isn't one of his staple heroes. This isn't his puck. This isn't his um, TA. This isn't some of his other well-known heroes, but yet he played it very well, and uh, I, I do like seeing the Titan come back despite his ultimate still being pretty easy to get around uh, if you build the proper way. And you, I mean, I look over on uh, on the lineup here of Cloud9, Mirana and Gyro very commonly build BKBs. You know, it's not out of their comfort level to build that item. So when you're against a Ravage, it's like, okay, well, I'm definitely going to do that then. And, you know, it's not really going to throw me off of my build. Gyro is, like, always BKB. You know, you'd never see one without a BKB. So, you know, I was like, well, that's going to be pretty good for Cloud9 then because they're going to kind of already have that built into their thought process of their items. Uh, the Invoker, Quaswex, the Bone 7, um, you know, very great with control. 
you know, they uh, that kind of saved them sometimes where they were getting shoved in their base. He was able to tornado EMP and, like, completely push them out purely on those two spells alone. Um, but at the same time, uh, it just wasn't enough. They, they, they just kind of got an out team played. And uh, Emerald Bulldog, this was, like, his best game I've probably ever seen him play. Except for the beginning. Except for <laughs> except for the two creep score. Uh, I guess I can't go into detail about that. But the rest of it... And this is where I really saw that Blink Dagger shine. This is where I was talking about from the beginning of the cast. Uh, to get those Blinks on Gyrocopter and get the Sheeps down was how they killed him. And how they really won some of the late game team fights. And uh, it was really impressive. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And, I mean, this is... Uh... A really neat build to come out from them at the end of the game. Sheepstick, Blink Dagger, Mjolnir, the Power Treads, MKB, and Four Staff. So he really... I, I think you get the best of every world that has ever been. Um, <laughs> you get the control, you get the movement, the ability to split push, you get raw right clicks, and, alright, I guess he wasn't the most durable person, if that's what you're missing. <laughs> Jeez, where's your 7th slot mech? Admirable. Well, he had the seven slot refresh orb. Did there you not you notice that? I did not. I had to speed watch. Somebody's... He bought his own courier at the end of the game and bought a refresh orb with all his extra money. And he used it purely to cast Wrath of Nature twice to push the lanes. That's all. And then he would put it back on the courier and send it back to base. That was that was it. Because I guess when you have eight thousand gold. What 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 are you gonna do? Like, I guess you might as well build something like that. That's pretty good. Where was his? Okay, geez, fine. Where's your eighth slot Agnum Scepter? I guess. I mean, you know, for a fifty-four minute game, I guess that's pretty good when you just have a courier bringing you an item. So <laughs> to use like for Wrath of Nature. <laughs> I mean, it's just funny, but it's uh, it was it did some work. But yeah, I. I I, I definitely give the t- tip of the hat here to uh, to uh, Admiral Bulldog on his uh, bread and butter. You heard it here first, folks. Jay wants to give Admiral Bulldog the tip. Of my hat. <laughs> oh. Anyway. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, game four? Oh, wait, no. Here's well, that took way too little time on game three. I think we need to get back to there. Yeah, let's give another 20 <laughs> minutes at least. What did you think about the loader build? Because I thought it was actually really neat. Mm. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to stop talking. Refresh my memory. Maybe. Okay. Uh, he winds up going, the power treads, I believe into the Helm of the Dominator, into BKB, Basher, Abyssal, Hyperstone. That could be completely wrong in the item build. And I'm going to, you know what, let's confirm that. But those were the items. I can't confirm that those were the actual items. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not too out of the ordinary. The life steal, obviously, you get you see that in different games. If he has to kind of go uh, toe to toe with some of these carries, which in this case, obviously, both Marana and uh, and Gyro, he kind of has to duke it out with a lot of the times. Um, you know, the Abyssal is an amazing late game here uh, item because he'll get too too much attack speed, and uh, obviously, getting uh, <laughs> that stun to go through BKB on Gyro is one of the ways you kill him late game. So, uh, really good item build. He he really struggled early game, which you couldn't blame him for. Uh, you know, he was up against uh, some really hard-hitting heroes. And, uh, it, you know, he was also against... Uh, you know, I was talking about how Marana, Gyro, go, B, uh, go BKB. They also were really great MKB heroes, both of them. And against the, uh, against the PA, it's like, all right, this makes perfect sense to... Uh, <laughs> to go for an MKB, and the evasion now no longer a useful uh, ability on him. So, uh, you know, he was kind of up against a lot. Their team, I feel like, was against a lot of easy-to-build items for the other team, but they still made it work. Yeah, I mean, I just think it was neat that you see this, you know, coup de grace is enough. What do we do to make myself relevant in a team play? Get tankier and provide some additional utility. I mean, really, I feel like what more could you want out of a carry other than um, mobility, durability, being able to apply a strong slow, now also being able to bash effectively. I mean, I, that's, I, I think, a really good setup, and while that might slow down your farm, going a build like this as opposed to you know going for a Battle Fury, they 
clearly able to make it work. And I feel like this is a good example of like a more active brawling oriented PA than one that wants to sit back and farm until she reaches critical mass and can three shot people. Yeah, no, I, I definitely thought it was a uh, it was a good stuff, and I think we moved the game four. I think I think we've I think we pushed the push the limit on that one. So, game four, two to one favor of the alliance now. Uh, picks coming out, Cloud Nine back to their brew, got the tide, got the puck, Shakiro, and this is the faceless. I was talking about that Shakiro faceless uh, combo coming alive here against the Nature's Prophet for alliance again. Io uh, disruptor or disruptor, as some people call him. Uh, Ricky, Ricky, and Storm Spirit. Ricky. Storm Spirit last pick, may I say. So, this is where I'm going to emphasize the draft. We haven't done that a lot in uh, some of these games. But this one I feel like it's really important to emphasize. Because uh, the first two, the first four picks, let's say, Alliance, right? They uh, they go Nation's Prophet, Io, Disruptor, and Ricky. All right, Ricky is uh, picked up. Obviously, Ricky is really good, except against people who give True Sight. And then Faceless Void, who's all obviously reveals him. Uh, Faceless gets picked up by Cloud9. And you're like, okay, that's really good. Storm Spirit then is their last pick. When you already see a Faceless Void on the other team, I feel like, I feel like very, very, very questionable. I'm seeing Storm Spirit pick 19th and Faceless pick 20. Are you sure? It's... That's what that Dota says. Well, I didn't think that happened that way. <laughs> J4Y's reality and that Dota's reality conflicting. I will say very though that conflicting. I found this draft very strange in that silence is prioritized so heavily. And you even see in some team fights that it's redundant. Um, there were like there was that great team fight where Eternal Envy is caught in silence. He's dragged back into the silence with the electric vortex. And it stops him from being able to play his ultimate. Really stops C9 from being able to turn that fight around in the way that they probably should have. He even um, mistakenly jumps into the trees and stops himself from being able to drop a, a game-changing ultimate. But I just don't understand and i don't know if you can help me out here with this why do you have to have not only the ricky cloud not only the disruptor ultimate but also an orchid on the storm spirit silence is great yeah that's they're, all i got no i mean I, I mean i don't know it, it's it's pretty questionable there are great targets a lot of them that have the potential to be spread out for silence I got that. But this seems like a lot of commitment. On Especially, like, I don't know. I feel like two of these I get. If you go Disruptor, if you go Storm Spirit, and Storm Spirit goes Orchid, okay. Can't hate it. That's fine. But, you know, I just... You saw so, more than once where the silences are sort of overlapping, where they're maybe not being the most effective. And really, not that it was Loda's fault, but the Ricky seems pretty underwhelming i mean i just keep seeing flashbacks of when they try to gank pile i die and the jungle who does this amazing ravage at the perfect time to stop them from being able to to get a kill on him but he had anchor smashed loda already and being invisible he didn't know he was there but loda sitting there was like okay well now you want to reduce damage let's do this anyway. <laughs> I felt like it was a questionable gank in the first place, and really one of the, like, the first plays, and was like, mm, are we sure we want to be doing this? Uh, to come out from Alliance. But, I, I... I don't know. I think this, though, too, is a great example of a game where, to Loda's point of the belief in the metagame about being tanky teamfighters, clearly C9 agree, because Faceless Void, Tidehunter, Brewmaster, um, and even Jakiro, like you had mentioned earlier, being a, a tanky support that's also interested in team fight potential. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, and Jakiro, uh, Ali just making some big plays. You know, he ganked mid Storm Spirit pre six multiple times, ensured multiple kills. That is obviously the best time to gank him uh, before he can zip away. Uh, and with that brew there, really helped give him a nice lead in that middle lane. Faceless, uh, you know, on that side lane against HR Profit when we've won, had a big CS lead. Uh, you know, able he was maxing out his uh, you know the, the the stun 
to uh, lock them down. And obviously, when you get level six ulti, uh, all you have to do is get a couple of those bashes, and it does way too much damage thanks to that buff in the chrono. So I, I don't know. I think it just their their composition just was like perfectly matched. Um, against alliances here and you know despite the draft order even though for some reason my notes say otherwise maybe i was just a little high or drunk or both but i i think honestly that you know faceless was just too good of a pick and maybe they should even i don't I, i'm really curious now who their fifth their extra ban was because i don't see who would be more valuable of a ban than faceless with that lineup already picked out let me help you out here. Let me, let me take a quick peek. The last bands yes. were uh, Naga Siren by The Alliance and Invoker by Cloud9. Naga Siren. Well, I guess. Team fight? Uh, potential carry, although you do... It could have been an off-lane puck. I mean, sleep is good against uh, Ricky, Love sleep. against... Uh, I wish we could get more of it in real life, but, uh, you know, I guess a lot of these heroes, I, I definitely agree, and, yeah, the split push kind of, uh, or also the way to stop Major Profit split push, I guess I could see that too, but I don't know, I just feel like Faceless, I don't know, he's such a strong hero, and, well, this clearly showed that he had what it take took to uh, shut down these heroes, and I'm just flashing back now, there was one juke where Ricky, uh, he... He tried to gank Jakiro in mid lane by himself. And he went on on him. Aoi starts juking through trees. He pops his BKB, Ricky does, to make sure he doesn't get locked out. So he continues to chase, completely loses vision, and then has to run away. And literally does maybe half of Jakiro's health. It was, like, so sad. But, you know, that was kind of the moral of the story of this game. It just went that whole direction for them. And. You know, this is one of the few games where Admiral Bulldog couldn't really get much going for him uh, on his Nature's Profit. I mean, there's constant pressure this game, you know, as you mentioned before, um, being prevalent in uh, the series. Um, you know, I feel like, yeah, it just it just didn't wind up working out for him. And Draskal mentions, you know, it's uh, tough to play Ricky from behind. They're never really able to, to make it work super effectively. And, yeah, I don't know. I... I just feel like this is a very strange draft. Not that you can say that the whole game <laughs> would go down to a draft, but I felt like it didn't necessarily help. And you know, they were I wouldn't call them kind of team slippery in a way. Because they got the Ricky, oh, they got the okay. Storm Spirit, they got the Nature's Prophet, the IO. They got a lot of tons of mobility. You're kinda of about mobility gaming. This was another lineup that had a lot of it going on for them, but not only did they have the faceless, they had uh Ty, they had these other great C C heroes. Uh, they went great CC items, you know, the sheep stick on Puck and Brew, and then the Yules on on uh, on the Puck as well. Uh, they had just tons and tons of CC to lock down these heroes. And, you know, at the end of the day, it was just way too much for them. You know, they couldn't really get any head-on fights going. You know, their lineup was never really designed for head-on fights. It was about Storm Spear jumping in, helping with a pickoff with Ricky, and then hopefully turning the fight from that point, but it never really went that way for them. Yeah, I totally agree. Game five, the signing game. But it, I mean, I, I, I love me some admirable double and druid. Um, I can't, I can't hate on. It. I mean, really, that that's all I really needed to see this game. I feel like there were some interesting things. I mean, we get to see uh, Wraith Gang for the first time in the series. Bat Rider makes it in this game as well. Uh, have some great team fight coming out. We get to see Eternal Envy on Luna, which I feel like is a, a hero we're really familiar yeah. uh, with seeing him on. And this, again, being coupled up with a, an Io, sort of like similar in the vein of the gyrocopter idea. Um, spoiler alert, unfortunately it doesn't work out the we spoiled best. this like a mile ago. For Apparently Cloud. it's in distance a mile ago. Um, yeah, no, it, it, here's the thing. And this is another draft falter that I want to say. And this one I confirmed. So you know what? You try oh, okay. You try your best to shut me down here. But uh, uh, Alliance Star, of course, they got that Bat Rider right away. And uh, who's been getting banned pretty much every game. And C9 counters that with Enigma and Tidehunter. They go crazy AoE team fight. 
So what does Alliance do? Ruby. They get the guy, the hero that's literally like made to counter these kind of heroes for his team because he's able to steal those ultis so effectively. Uh, of course, if he positions himself correctly. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, it, the rest of the team comp is great for Lions, don't get me wrong. But I just feel like Cloud9 just, in their minds, thought this was a good idea to get all this CC. But the way all the fights played out and everything, it never, ever went the way they wanted. Uh, primarily had to do, I think, with uh, being scared of Rubik. Uh, you know, they actually, the casters even talked about it when you watch the fights. Ty generally always got his Ravage off, which was good. But Enigma did not get a lot of black holes off, uh, particularly in fights where you really wanted him to. And the reason was they didn't know where Rubik was. He was always putting himself in a great position where he wasn't going to get locked down with his team. And he could interrupt or steal or both. And I think that fear really drove them to not fight nearly as efficiently and effectively as they wanted to. Yeah, and I think, too, just looking at the draft, I mean, that makes Wraith King an even more attractive choice because this is a hero that's about having uh, round two. You know, C9's lineup really is about you blow everything at once and then everything after the big ultimates go off is on the back of Luna being farmed and Razor hopefully having Aghanims so that that's doing enough work or them being able to just push in relentlessly. Because... Other than those two heroes, everything else is about team fight. Um, you know, the IO is of course about buffing up the Luna, but because there's just so much riding on the back of those ultimates that p you okay, Wraith King, now you're gonna kill him. Great. Now it's our turn to reinitiate. And what are you gonna be able to do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I really did. I felt like Ali, um, you know, did the best he could. I looking at the team fight about the seven minute mark in the top lane, a beautiful three man black hole almost immediately canceled by a flame break. And, you know, there was just a lot of stuff to really make his life difficult. And, you know, even going for the BKB, trying to see if that would help him out. But even then you still have the fact that Lasso could interrupt that. So, um, and then the entangle by Adam Bulldog. So I, um, I have to say that's one thing as, uh, a lone druid player that I absolutely love seeing, and I honestly don't know why I haven't done it more. I've mentioned before that I'm curious about mech on lone druid. I don't do it all that often. I will say, though, that I do love lads on lone druid, even though some people in the pubs like to give me crap for it. I think it's a beautiful item if you need to, to go early. And... Um, I think the pipe is another example of a, a great choice if you have to try to go a little bit defensive when you're bare because now the item gives you the AoE health regeneration and when you go a build like <laughs> Maelstrom Radiance, the bear tends to take some damage. So giving him some longevity is um, really, I think, uh, a nice choice. Yeah, absolutely. That. The, the the lone druid was a really solid pick here, and it, you know despite the razor getting picked to kind of counter out his damage of the bear, it, it still wasn't enough. This wraith king was doing way too much work for his team. Um, primarily the slow, he was always on the front line, so always really well positioned, willing to sacrifice for the team. And uh, as soon as he died, the whole the whole C nine lineup getting caught in this massive slow AOE. And, you know, they were out of position at that point. They couldn't go in. Uh, you know, their 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 blinks were always, uh, you know, not able to go off because of shiny the shininess of the other team. <laughs> and uh, it, it just really went completely in the favor. And this game was not as close as the other games. It really seemed to continually heavily favor uh, Alliance throughout. And... Uh, I guess this is why some of these heroes are getting banned so much, is because you, when you see them in action, you're like, wow, they can be really, really strong in the right circumstances. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, I mean, this one, I maybe more so than the last game, you might be able to blame the draft, because, I mean, the back-to-back the -back team fight, I think, is really, you know, like you said, maybe a little bit too greedy and maybe too easily countered out by EGM. But you look at some of the other choices, you know, yeah, you have uh, a Razor going up against your Lone Druid. Well, if you have Radiance, and he's always going to be doing damage. Um, there's going to be just straight up damp, uh, a big damage gap you have to close. The bear is going to be doing damage for longer, and he's always going to have the Entangle, 
which is uh, fantastic to have. And, you know, they even had their lone druid doing more than just the damage. Because of building the pipe, he was utility and did help um, provide them with, uh, you know, that team-oriented item. And, you know, you have uh, the telekinesis, you have the enchant, you have the Wraith King, Death, Ultimate, Slow, all really great things to help your bear get off some extra attacks. So I, I think it's a really strong draft from Alliance. And, you know, just to say it again, maybe a little bit too greedy with the, the back-to-back team fight pickup. Yep, that's what I agree completely. And I, you know, especially, like I said, with Rubik on the board, who else would they pick there? <laughs> it was, like, so obvious. I, I think they did a really great job swapping that up. And uh, it was really important for the player to be positioned well, too. Like I said, if he got caught out, you know, there was one team fight, I believe it was bottom lane, um, where you saw Enigma and Tidehunter both blink on top of Rubik while the rest of their team was getting destroyed because they were so focused, like tunnel visioning, <laughs> to kill this Rubik so he couldn't steal the ultimates that the other, the Loon and the other players were just getting killed. And, you know, it was that kind of play that, that scared, you know, being afraid of what could happen that really led to these fights just completely skewing in the favor of lines. Um, yeah. It was, uh, either way, congratulations, I Alliance. And like we were saying, it, it really, really was something else. They're really coming back to that, that status that they ended TI3 with. You know, it's, uh, it's making me that much more, once again, excited for, um, for TI4. You know, originally I'm like, oh, DK, got this. No one's even on their level right now. Watching them play recently, watching these other teams play recently, I think it's back to being a toss up. I, I, who knows what's going to happen? It's going to really come down to, who handles the land scene really well, and uh, what kind of strats are going to run in these games? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't think, you know, as much as we might want to try to predict or theory craft about which team stands the best chance, I think there's so much leading into the international. Every team is going to decide to try to come online at a different time. You know, they might be concerned themselves, well, if we get into really good form now, are we going to be burnt out by the time the international happens? You know, there's so many... Um, the timing, I feel like, is so um, such an interesting factor this time because of the other tournaments that are going on around it. I feel like anything we see before the actual international doesn't really tell us a whole lot about what's going to happen at that event, which, I mean, all, all, the only thing we do know is that it's going to be amazing just because yeah, of, of course. The, the skill level that we already see coming out and the, the quality of the teams that are going to be there. There's one last thing I have to say. Yeah. Did you... Oh, you didn't get to. At the end of the event, after the win, mm-hmm. you remember how awkward the handing of out of the Aegis was for TI2? Yes. Like, how it was like, here you go, and then everyone's like, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, there was more awkward of an ending, in my opinion, of this Dream League. Uh, Perfect. There, uh, Bruno came on stage with, of course, his super beautiful outfit, whatever he had on, and he he asked them, he's like, do you guys know how to pop bottles of champagne? And they're like, uh, what? And they gave all five players bottles of champagne and said, all right, shake them up and pop the bottles. And you just saw them shaking these bottles for so long and not knowing what the hell they were doing. And then, like, finally a couple of them... Uh, Got them open. And Loda, you just see Loda struggling so much. I, I, The way I put it, you got to see his vinegar strokes. Uh, oh. Good league, good league, the league reference there. But, uh, yeah, he uh, he was just, he was going, ah, and just trying to shake this model. I'm sure there's a gif of it on the internet. You look somewhere, that has to be made a gif by now. But, uh. We're, I think. Unfortunately, still in the time where the nerd stigma is completely accurate. I just, that reminds me of there was a, a video of Team Liquid, like when they were all living together and preparing for the international, and they go outside to sports and <laughs> they're playing some basketball. It's fine, but there's just one of like Fluff trying to throw a frisbee, and it's just like, right into the side of the house like there's no like what are you guys doing just go back inside out of the sun just but yeah. one day one day they will be ballers and uh champions both yes of course but 
until then, uh, you all out there have crazy amounts of homework to do. You have to tell us what your favorite successful troll strategy is for the pub games. Drop by Facebook.com slash Dota On Demand. You can uh, tweet at Dota On Demand as well to tell us your answer to that. And you all have to race one another to winning the A to Z challenge to be the first one to get our stamp of approval and to be the champion of Alphabet. <laughs> so, so, do you have any other uh, closing thoughts, my friend? No, man. I think you nailed it all. Looking forward to those answers, as you said. Yeah, so go out there, guys. Play some Dota. Watch some Dota. See you next time.